Hey up and welcome to the Strategy Sessions. My name is Andy Jarvis and thank you for joining me for episode 22. The main guest today is Sarah Shimmons. Sarah is the Global Marketing Director for Smirnoff and an absolute hero of mine, as you'll probably tell from the quite creepy introduction I give her in a minute. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to tell you about a couple of things. A few notes from some advertisers, if you want to refer to it as that, but it's not advertisements, don't worry. Um, first thing is there's another Friends Of event coming back. If you don't know, Friends Of is the uh, charity fundraising thing that I run where there's about 10 marketing experts who give up their time to um, do consultations for small businesses. What we do is you get 45 minutes, it costs you 25 quid, and um, all that money goes to Bernardo's in Northern Ireland. So it's a nice easy way for us to raise money for Bernardo's. It helps small businesses to um, improve their business and you get access to real top-notch consultants who ordinarily a small business might not be able to tap into. If you know a small business that needs a little bit of help, we've got all sorts of skills in there. There's a link in the show notes, but the address website is friendsof.co.uk. You can find all the details there. Wednesday the 9th of June is the next event. There's uh, slots at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock with each of about seven advisors this time. So do check that out. And uh, just a quick plug for the digital marketing strategy program that I've got with the University of Vasa. If you are looking at your training requirements for this year and you need to be a bit more strategic, you need to look to improve um, your digital marketing game. And uh, let me just give you a quick plug despite the name. It's just the marketing strategy. Um, and I explain that in the, in the module, in the, in the course as to what the difference is. So um, if you want to check that out, there's a link in the show notes. It's available on Teachable, so you can access it anywhere. And uh, look, I'm, I'm really proud of that course and the feedback's been great. People are finding it really useful. So go and get signed up. It's easy as well. I think it's like 250 euros. Do it now. It's easy. Right, enough of that. Let's hear from Sarah Shimmons. Let's it's not often you get to do something really like this where you get to interview somebody who may well have changed your life, who could you well be described as one of your heroes. I know that sounds a little bit cringeworthy when Sarah sat there going, oh no, what is he talking about? But Sarah Shimmons, welcome to the strategy sessions. Thank you, Andy. I'm very excited to be here. I'm really happy to have you on. So Sarah is the Global Marketing Director for Smirnoff. Um, but many, many years ago, uh, she was working at Tenants as brand manager, was it, at Tenants? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Brand or marketing manager at the time. Brand or marketing. And at that point, Sarah uh, had a conversation with me about the MSc in marketing at Ulster University. And I genuinely do draw a straight line between that conversation and ending up running next level marketing now, because it did it did change my life, those conversations that we had back then. So thank you very much. Well, that's very cute of you to say. <laughs> well, no, it's, well, we'll talk about the good old days um, in a little bit because I love talking about the good old days. But let's start with what you're doing now and where you are now. So the, if, I'll tell you, I'm very impressed. Global Marketing Director for Smirnoff. I don't care if you hate the job. It sounds like an amazing job. <laughs> yeah, it's a good job. I guess um, it's just one of the benefits of working for, for Diageo. You know, you just get those opportunities um, to grow. So that's kind of... That's what I put down rather than anything on my part. I put it down to the to the company in terms of, um, you know, able to uh, get promoted. And um, yeah, it's been good. So really enjoying it at the minute. And just to be over such a such a great brand, you know, it's such a household name in terms of Smirnoff. It's the world's number one uh, spirit brand. So globally, it's huge. So it's really good to be working on it because of all the different markets that I'm getting to talk to. And yeah, it's just broadened me in so many different ways. Um, so it's been great. Well, I'm going to come back to um, and tell, I'm going to tell you you're wrong as well when you put it down to the company. So, But we're going to come back to, to how you got to where you are in a, in a minute. But let's talk about Smyrna first. So the world's biggest spirit brand. And it's in... I don't know if it's in every country in the world, but it must be in hundreds of countries around the world. So that's exciting. It's a huge global brand, but it also must be quite daunting or challenging because the different country uh, restrictions and different brands and different marketplaces, it must be quite a challenge juggling a brand like that in so many different places. Yeah, it can be. I think one of the, the key things that you always have to remember or that one of the key responsibilities um, that we have on the global brand team is sort of creating that consistency across markets because you're always going to get things that are different in different markets, not culturally, but just from a, the brand's perspective. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, our job is kind of to make sure that the brand is showing up consistently or as consistently as possible. So it doesn't mean that it always has to look the same, but maybe it has the same tone of voice or maybe it has the same cultural relevance. So, you know, if we're focusing on one area of culture, um, in one market, we might see what's the interpretation of that in another market and how that shows up might be quite different, but at the core, they're the same. So it's really looking at how can you keep driving that consistency um, at a core level and then, you know, how that's executed in market is, is up to the markets. Um, there's always that sort of tension between what we want to do from a global perspective and then just being sensitive to what people also want to do in the local marketing and, and making sure people feel passionate and able to do their job and do what's best for the brand in those markets that they're in um, so that's what makes it so exciting because you get to partner with so many different people you know it's in every continent of the world so I wake up and I'm talking to people from all over the world in one day and I just find that you know it's really thrilling it's a, it's an amazing experience but also for me personally, it's just broadened my horizons massively. You know, I look back even three years and go, you know, I don't feel like I'm the same person uh, because you're just getting so much more cultural experience and getting to know people. And especially being from Northern Ireland, living in Northern Ireland for your whole life, you know, it's just it's just amazing um, on a personal level as well. So yeah, it's been good. Brilliant. I, mean, I remember um, in my days of, of doing beer marketing, I think it was. One of the global brands, I think it might have been Budweiser, it might have been Corona. It, it doesn't matter which one, but yeah. that that tension between what they wanted to do globally and what we were trying to do uh, locally to execute it, and I think it kind of reared its head once on St Patrick's Day, where we'd had this St Patrick's Day campaign passed through global, and you yeah. know when it just it, it stunk that it it would work perfectly well in American markets, but it was just something like, like if you roll this around Ireland, we're just going to spend the next week firefighting with people ripping us to pieces. Um, and that sort of pushback and, and those conversations were always interesting, let's put it that way. But um, it sounds like that you, you've taken a, um, a much more broader view on that and, and being able to execute in market quite strongly is important for the brand. Yeah, because one, you know, we try not to tie ourselves to occasions or events. We kind of try and start with the consumer, put them at the heart of it and say, you know, what are the occasions that they're drinking alcohol in and white spirits in and what are the key behaviors that we're seeing in those markets? And then we try and attach the brand to that. So think about, therefore, what is the brand's role? And that immediately makes you really relevant in those markets without necessarily having to focus on one key event or something that is happening culturally. Um, so I think that's, that's really helped us as well. It's kind of a combination of being super local, but also that sort of um, globalization um, so making sure it feels still feels quite big and it doesn't go too local but making sure that you've got the you know the behaviors the attitudes um, of the consumer in that market at, at the top of your mind um, so that's a big focus for us. Smirnoff is a brand it's 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 almost a heritage brand that's been around that long but it's still quite young youth focused cutting edge so there's an interesting tension there between a brand that's got years and years of history and that that young young um push and there's also the fact that it, it's been around for so long it means quite a lot to people you know people buy into brands don't they? and i think smirnoff would be one of those brands people feel is part of them so how do you manage all of that when you, you know, do you feel that the weight of the pressure of that well, I think, you know, it is high on meaning, um, you know, it's high in salience. So everyone knows about Smirnoff. There's very few people that don't know about Smirnoff and it's got a very high meaning. And so that's that's a positive. You know, I see that as a good thing rather than a challenge, because when everyone knows you um, and you do have that, you know, people have that knowledge of you across the world it's a lot easier then to go in and start marketing to those people and and having a bit of fun because you've already built up the base so you know for some brands um it's all about driving awareness whereas for us it's really going that level deeper so that makes it really exciting i think one area where we continue to strive to grow is in that distinctivity so in terms of making sure we remain distinctive within the market you know vodka is huge but it's kind of like bottled water in a way when you think about it, because you've got, you know, a lot of different vodkas, they all look, taste the same. So it's how do we differentiate ourselves? And I think that's why we've always had that role in, uh, you know, 
younger consumers, LDA plus consumers, um, and that youth culture is because we're trying to grow that distinctivity for ourselves. Um, so yeah, there, there's an in, interesting tension between we're a brand that's been around since 1864, but yet we're also trying to be in culture. But I think it goes back to, you know, we, we lean into that story of ourselves um, from where we came from. And that's sort of a credibility thing. And it's also, um, you know, shows the quality of the brand and how long we've been around for that really helps, but it's not enough because that's just too brand out. So we think about that as sort of our brand out strategy, but then you also need to be thinking about the lives of the consumers and what's relevant to them because you can say, oh, well, Smirnoff's been around since 1864 and this is the story of the brand and you will get consumers who just will be like, well, so what, what does that mean to me? Yeah. <laughs> so it's how we can make it um, relevant and make, you know, some of those, um, some of those things from our history come forward and, um, and interact with people today so that's kind of where we're what we aim to do and if you can say this without um sharing any company secrets what, what are the key markets for smirnoff and you know so do you, do you tier those when you, you're looking across the globe do you have it tiered in sort of tier one markets tier two tier three or how, how do you break it up what's the yeah, it's just brand basically you know in terms of the different markets we have so our biggest market is north america um, and obviously UK and Ireland would be high up on those lists on that list as well. But then we have other markets like South Africa or um, markets in uh, LAC where we're also really popular. And it just depends because as a, you know, as a brand, we're not just Smirnoff Vodka. So you, you think of us as a trademark, we're Smirnoff Ice. We have got a lot of different ready to drink products uh, globally. So you can go into a market and Smirnoff looks very, very different to what it does in the UK and Ireland because it's focused on a flavored vodka or on a RTD. Um, and so it's quite interesting to see how it is a bit of a chameleon. Um, so it, it, it means that actually there's a lot of markets where it's really important for us to keep um, to keep them high on our agenda because one might be really strong on Smirnoff Vodka, but then another might be really strong on some of our other products. So um, there's a good mix of countries in there, I would say. Smirnoff Ice, um, a drink that holds a special place in my heart and um, yeah, and, and probably nearly killed me during my university years, which was fantastic. Although my favourite bit about Smirnoff Ice was when I first moved to Northern Ireland and found some folks had it on draft. <laughs> so that was insane but uh, let's not get into that let's not get into that too much but yeah um, it's having a bit of a renaissance um so we're not i so i think well just because it's interesting because if you think about consumer behavior at the minute and what people are doing they're in lockdown they're looking for convenience and so that whole segment is really growing so ready to drinks pre-mix in a can that you can just take home and 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 crack open um they're, they're having a bit of a moment. So Smirnoff Heist is actually quite high on my agenda at the minute. Excellent. So and long may it continue yeah. to, long may it continue. Um, we, a couple of uh, weeks ago, months ago probably now, we had uh, Katie Jackson from TBWA, the agency in London. They launched a brand called Hun Wine, which is a uh, pre-packaged wine uh, cans. And they, they launched it was, I think, two weeks after the first lockdown came and they, they pivoted and, changed their whole communications plan to because they, they had loads of outdoor and they went with it anyway and, and changed the brand the messaging to be really quirky and things like that so um i hate having to, to ask the covid questions on on the podcast but look i think it's interesting what you've done on, from a global level so with, with bars shutting down across the world uh, people being locked down i imagine that kind of really impacted what sales for at least some part, part of the time but what was what did you change what did what stayed the same what what yeah. sort of allowances it's, have you it's, made? it's a really good question um it's been a whirlwind of a year to be totally honest for us for well, over a year now but um i think there were pivots that we needed to make very quickly um and we did that so a couple of things that spring to mind uh which really worked were taking that more short-term view um so, you know, in, in Diageo, we don't really think tactically um, as global brand teams. Um, so it's a lot of it is setting a five-year vision for the brand and where are we going next, not where we are right now in the next two or three months. So I think the biggest pivot we've made is really looking at on a quarter to quarter basis, what 
what do we need to be doing? What do we need to be changing? So it's really changed the pace. We've always been fast paced, but it's really been interesting to be involved in that um, year where we are thinking more tactically over the next three months while also keeping one eye on that future. So I think that's been really interesting um, to just focus on, on that time. And then the obvious things, which is, you know, people are drinking at home, they're not in bars anymore. So we've really focused in on how can we make sure that we optimize the channels where, where they are gonna see. So, you know, investing more in digital media, um, you know, pushing away from art of home, as you said, um, all that you've heard from, from other brands. So really focusing in on that consumer. And obviously e-commerce has become, has always been a big part of what Diageo does. And we've been doing it well for a number of years, but it's really put the focus on that for the global brand teams as well. And just making sure we're reflecting the occasion that consumers are in. And that doesn't mean, you know, we want to show people sitting on the sofa in their pajamas, but it just means that we're more uh, relevant in our copy lines and, and how we reach out to consumers. Um, and make sure that we're, you know, recognizing the current situation that they're in. So I think obviously that's been a big focus and the shift to the off trade from on trade, which is the most obvious one. So making sure we're optimized in, in the retailers and, you know, that that's, that's happening. And I think it's been interesting for me because there's a lot of different markets that have, you know, had waves in different times. So where one market's opened and other ones closed, there's always that opportunity to, to still be focused on the on trade in some markets. But yeah, it's, it's been- It's to say then for the last year, you've not been sat with your feet up. Um, being no, exactly, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we're, we're really in our stride now. Um, I think from, from COVID, because at the start, it's always, it was a bit of a shock for everyone. Uh, everybody had that shock at the start, but I think, we've kind of hit our stride now with um, with the activities that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just kind of one eye on the long term, but also looking at the short term as well. It's really, really important for us. How have you found, I don't know, I'm, I'm, this is more of a personal question, because I'm looking at how my efficiency has changed and um, being able to do back-to-back -back meetings and workshops and, and more workshops in, in short spaces of time. Mm -hmm. And I look to the, the future and think, I don't know how I'm going to stay as busy as I am. I can't juggle as many clients if I've got to fly to uh, Newcastle for a day workshop there and I've got to be in London the day after to do this. And I'm like, how am I actually going to manage all of that if I can't just do back-to-back -back Zooms all day? Is that a, a concern for you in terms of how you're going to juggle your workload in the future? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting in that um, we... So I've done shot TV ads on just by Zoom, you know, where I've just, as a client logged into zoom and watched what's going on um in a world where pre-covid i would have had maybe 10 days in a country in a market uh, to shoot a tvc and being there and probably not being needed for you know half the day um and just been sitting around and also just watching what's going on so i think there's efficiencies that we're going to get out of this year that probably won't go away so i think there will be more online um shoots that we'll be doing and also things like research. So, you know, when we had research groups previously, you would have showed up in, in real life. And now I can just log on and Zoom. So I can log on to research groups wherever they are. And of course that, that ability was there before, but it just wasn't the done thing. Mm -hmm. So I think things like that will say. Um, personally, I think I do, it's been a hard year, you know, it's been hard work. So there is a concern about how do you come out of this and, you know, how many hours are you going to work? Because me on a personal level, I find that I've gone deeper into work. I've really used it as my outlet in a way. Um, and I think up until last year, I'd probably have been scared to say, you know, work as an outlet for me. And I would have shied away from that and said, oh, I need to give myself a break. Whereas I'm sort of in the headspace now where I'm happy to put the hours in and just do it because I get so much enjoyment. It sounds cheesy. AF I know but I'm getting so much enjoyment out of what I'm doing that actually you know yes it's work but I'm just I feel like I'm learning every day and I'm doing so much stuff that I love that yeah it is an outlet and it's where I'm most comfortable so you know nothing else to do either is this there's only so many <laughs> as beautiful as it is where you where you live there's only so many times you can walk up and down those canals isn't it 
I uh, know it is very true. So it does, it passes the time, doesn't it? And just on that, I don't think we talked about where you are at the minute. So you relocated to Amsterdam. Yeah. Uh, as part of this job as well. So in the middle of a pandemic, you, you're, um, I, I can see from social media, exploring various waffle shops and um, and walking up and down some beautiful scenes. Is that, that's about your life, isn't it, in the minute? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it's been really nice. You know, when we came over here to Amsterdam um, in September and things were a bit more open here than they were back home. So it was nice to be able to go out and, and do things that we couldn't, but it was pretty short lived. Um, you know, the lockdown here is, is the same as what it is back home, but it's been nice just to be a change of scenery. is just as good as a break, I think. So it's been nice just to be here and experience something different when the possibilities are there. Um, a great city as well, isn't it, Amsterdam? Yeah, it's really good. It's been fun. Uh, we've really enjoyed it, but it's super quiet, obviously, at the minute. There's no tourists. I think there's only around 800,000 people actually live in Amsterdam. So uh, the majority of people you see when you're here are tourists. So it's been really quiet, but it's been a nice way to experience the place. Um, so really, really enjoying it. Excellent. Let, let's talk about training a little bit. So you kind of mentioned you enjoy work there and the Diageo culture is built heavily around training and investing in people. Um, I think we've spoken before, of, not on this call, obviously, but about the, the not just the level, but the breadth of training and, and the ability to tap into lots of different training there. So tell us a bit about that and how it works. Yeah, I guess there's a couple of things. So we have our own internal training program, um, programs. So uh, there's the Diageo Way of Brand Building, which is one of the core programs that every marketeer in Diageo does. Um, so it's internal, um, not self-taught, but you know, it's leaders in the business and people in the business that are teaching us. Um, and it makes it super relevant to Diageo, but it also means that everybody's on the same wavelength. Um, so it's just a huge training program that we do. And then internally, we also have like a My Learning Hub, which is an internal learning hub with every topic you can imagine. So if you have, you know, for example, when I joined the company, one of the projects I had to do was like an innovation project. And I hadn't done innovation in Diageo, of course, I'd done it external. So I was able to go on to my learning hub and, and find the innovation courses. And there was everything from, you know, a two hour course through to a week long course where you could just do it online. So it's really, great in terms of what they have and then also you'll remember from your our time in um, on the masters but we also get access to a lot of um, articles like you do when you're at uni so mm -hmm. you know if you've got an interest in some part of marketing and you go in and you search you can basically find all relevant articles that you'd have to pay for otherwise so it's a really really good program and it doesn't just focus on the marketing side and like what we're doing it also focuses on like inclusion and diversity we'll have specific modules on that um lots of different types of things that that you wouldn't necessarily expect there's mindfulness courses on there um i think it's just yeah it's a really good system um it's less about external training and more about what we can learn from each other um what we can learn from sort of senior leaders in the company but also external people that they've brought in so if they bring in someone and they do a course for one group it gets uploaded and then everyone can have access to it so it's really a great system. And then you've just the on the job learning is incredible. You know, I'm just learning so much every day. So it's just, it's hard to explain when you're not in the Diageo system, but it's it's just, um, yeah, it's the opportunities to learn are, are massive just with the systems and the programs we have, you know, things like marketing effectiveness where, you know, before probably before I realized when I joined Diageo that before I probably didn't have that much of an idea of um, what is the most ex effective channels to use for each brand that I was managing in other, other companies or you know what makes it more effective or what's the return on investment on one channel versus the other um, where does the brand come in where does seasonality come in I didn't know that much to be honest you know when I think back versus now we have internal programs where you literally know everything about every penny you spend you know what it's doing so the level of knowledge you're getting just off the back of that system is incredible so I just feel I've learned so much in terms of what's the most effective channels and you know how how you can make sure you're you're getting your money's worth basically and before that you'd obviously invested in your own education and, and this is why 
to come back to what I've said at the start, when he said, oh, you know, you, you just happen to be lucky because of the agio and this, that, and the other, I'm calling bullshit on that. So mm-hmm. You put a lot of effort into all the jobs that you were to prior to this, and you put a lot of effort into your own education as well. So um, let's talk about the MSc. We, we've both done that, and that's what the, the, the programme you yeah. talked about and I ended up doing. And, and so you, that was your sort of first comeback into education, would that be? Yeah. And I think, you know, because I'd done, I did law whenever I was at uni. And to be honest, I, I didn't love it. Um, and I got my degree, but it just wasn't a passion. Um, and so whenever I got into marketing and I was there and I had experience, but I just felt like I needed something more, something like tangible to show that, you know, I was, I was good for these promotions and other jobs that were going to come up. So I think the MSC was like, I don't know what you think, Andy, but I think it was like a really great base. Um, you know, if you want to get into marketing or if you're already in marketing and you're maybe a brand manager, a senior brand manager, or even like a marketing assistant and you want to really take it to the next level or if you're thinking I'm in a marketing job but I want to run my own company then I think the MSc is the perfect course to be honest you know it really helped me and I think you've said it yourself it's helped you I think it's great as a base um uh but I think there's other stuff on top of that probably that you can do that I was less aware of again you know until the last three years or so in terms of other opportunities that might be available outside of that that can sort of propel you forward a bit more so I thought about going forward and doing the MBA as well in in Ulster so I I started it and I did like a few of the modules but I didn't finish it um you know Diageo came up and I, I I went for this job and it sort of meant I didn't have the time but also it's sort of once I was in the company and in the role I'm in now, I feel like if you're going to do an MBA, you should do it through one of the bigger schools, just being totally honest. Like I think the masters at Jordanstown or Ulster is brilliant, but if you want to then go to the next level, I think it is either you have to go and pay a fortune to, um, to do an MBA or there are a lot of other programs out there that I just wouldn't have been aware of that are free that you can apply for as well so one of the ones that I've actually applied for at the minute is the marketing academy I'm not sure if you've heard of it but basically it's a UK and US um, uh, program and it's an eight month long program where you can um, basically learn from some of the leaders of the biggest companies in the world biggest FMCG companies more or less in the world Um, and they have two levels so they have level for people like me who would love to get to like a board level position in the future. And then they also have a course for C- CMOs who would like to get into like CEO positions mm-hmm. at two levels. Um, and that's something I just wouldn't have been aware of before. So I've applied for that this year. And I feel like that is more in line with where I need to go next versus the MBA. Um, but yeah, I think the the Ulster course was a good grounding. What, what do you think? Uh, I, I loved it. I I would probably say a third of it was kind of basic key grounding in stuff. Good reminder, good refresh. Mm-hmm. Um, with the marketing background, if you asked me at the time, I was probably a little bit irritated at going over that because there was a lot mm-hmm. of people without a marketing background doing it. But I think with a little bit of time between when I finished it, it was actually a really good reminder. <laughs> you know, when you, At the time, I was like, well, I know this, but actually looking back, it was a good reminder. Um, a third of it I thought w- was brilliant mm. and a third of it I thought was a little bit mm, mm. not so sure about yeah. but on the whole I recommend it to people all the time um, you know overall I think it was a really solid course uh, and what it did for me I, I sort of I had a sport management and marketing degree and I've been working in marketing for a lot of years but I was very very tactical I, mm. you know I could sort of feel what was working for the companies I was working for because I was embedded in them but when I was moving I was struggling a little bit in some agency stuff where I didn't feel I could really connect with the projects I was working on and the ideas didn't quite flow and it was just tactical that's all it was yeah having structures and systems and processes in place following the degree and then sort of working I was like hold on a minute there's a way to come there's a process for this and once you get through the process and that's kind of what I do now is just go through process with people you know yeah. I, I, think, I, I think it's interesting you say that you know because um 
you felt as though the basics or you know the fundamentals were the bit you already knew and that always kind of impressed me about you I think when you said to me like I knew I knew all of this stuff because me coming from a background in law and then go getting into marketing those fundamentals didn't come as naturally to me so you know I didn't know all of the big names in marketing um in terms of literature mm-hmm. which you did but I think a lot of people you would be surprised at how many people maybe didn't mm-hmm. know that because I think you you were just kind of you know you, you were into that side of it you knew the background the literature I think for me it brought the course brought that to life for me where I maybe wouldn't have had the same um levels of knowledge around that so I yeah think one, I guess it does different things for different people doesn't it yeah it, it definitely does and I think one thing that I um and I'm not going to give away your age on this Sarah but I, I think the fact that we did it <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think the fact that we did it with, with a few years a few miles under our belt I mean I I, I look at the course and the I, I referred to them as the kids because I was in my thirties when I when I did the course. Yeah. But there, there, there was there was people who come straight from a degree straight into doing the MSc, and, and I always worried that some of those people were just learning what the book said. And actually, what I liked when we, when we talked about it was, uh, and God, this sounds like we just used to have these boring coffee meetings where we talked about app marketing literature. We didn't, but when we talked about it, it we understood what the literature could mean in a practical way to implement it rather than just saying the literature says this, which is what I felt some of the people who were coming straight from an undergrad into doing a postgrad were doing, just learning it, and then that was it. Whereas yeah, we were going okay. to apply it, which was a bit different. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, like, educationally, how, you know, people now, there are opportunities for people to, like, get work experience rather than go to uni, even. Um, and I think it's really interesting, because I agree with you. I think once you've got that on-the-job experience, everything clicks into place like I would far rather see someone coming that had a degree and then hadn't done their master's for five or six years than someone coming for a job that had done them back to back because I kind of I agree with you totally I think it sort of it pieces it together when you're already in the market and you've got experience so and there's, a, there's a lot of people at the minute in, in marketing circles who would, who would tell you that formal education um, degrees, postgrads in marketing are not relevant. And I, I'm always wary of being the guy with the postgrad who, who defends the postgrad. Of course mm. But actually, I, I genuinely think, I, I know when I go into a company and I'm working with them, I know when I'm working with a team with people who've got formal qualifications and when people have just learned on the job. And that's not to say you shouldn't just learn on the job. You absolutely should. I, I don't, and, and there's things universities shouldn't teach, in my opinion, like tax, like SEO, PPC, some universities yes. do. I'm like, no, that's not what you should be doing because um, it changes too quickly for them. But I, I think there's a place for both. But the, I'm, I'm definitely against the current movement of you don't need a degree, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money. I'm like, mm. Mm, it's interesting. I think it depends on the person because, you know, it depends on maturity levels as well, I think. But again, in the company I'm in and in the job I'm in I've managed people that have come straight out of uni and they are you know Diageo is their first job so they're maybe an assistant brand manager and some of those people for me have been incredible like really really good and I don't know what it is I look at them and I go one or two people in particular come to mind and I, I look at them and I say gosh you know they have a mind that I didn't have at 30 Mm -hmm. for whatever reason and I don't know if it's because of the university they went to or their upbringing or what that level of maturity is just there and I think especially in the bigger companies you have a range of marketing rules obviously and I think there are marketing rules where like creative rules where is that formal education really needed if you're a creative like it's really hard to know the answer to that because I think there are situations where, yeah, I've worked with people with little real experience, real experience in marketing, but they have been better than people I know that have got 10 years experience. So I think it depends on the situation you're put into once you get into a job and also like what maybe what you know you've been to or I'm not sure. Or maybe the younger generation are just smarter than us now. I don't know, but oh, it's amazed me. It's really amazed me. Yeah, I mean the kid, the kids are all right. I mean, there's 
I, I'm doing some lecturing. I did guest lecturing at um, Liverpool Uni, John Moore's Uni, and um, some of the some of the people on the masters there blow you away. Like, some of them don't, but <laughs> that's also worth saying. But some <laughs> of them do. You're like, oh wow, okay. Um, but I, I think it's always been just you, you get to a certain age, don't you? And you start thinking that it was always better when you were a kid. It wasn't. You know, so I grew up in the eighties. A lot of it was shit. But people are like, oh, it was much better then. Yeah, um, I know. it's true. So, so as we're talking about the good old days again, let, let's roll back a little bit because you've got you've got a CD that would make most people's eyes water, right? And you, you, know, you underplay it all the time, but you've worked for. Um, oh, look, let's, I'll let you talk about it. So, let's talk about your time at Tenants. What brands did you manage there? And then I want to talk about Vital as well. Yeah, so it was the beer brands that I managed. It was uh, Tenants, obviously. But we also had the distribution rights for ABI brands um, in Northern Ireland. So that was Budweiser, Bex, Corona. Uh, we also launched a few brands like Clomel and Heverly. Um, so there were a couple of brands as well. But all beer at that time. Yeah, all beer. And so Tenants is um, a, a bit of an institution in Northern Ireland. It, it, it's a brand people love um you know it's uh yeah well it, it's an interesting thing but it, it had a, there was a bit of an issue so tenants vital was a, a huge concert so if you're not in northern ireland um yeah, yeah. tenants vital was like the big outdoor gig of the summer um that was brought back i think you, you brought it back didn't you it kind of it was here for a few years disappeared and then you brought it back it used to be called i think it was witness originally and then it was brought back as tenants vital um mm -hmm. and then we had about a three-year run on that I think at the time. And I'm sure we had a conversation once about this. So I, I worked for the agency and, and Sarah ran the brand, which is where we met. And um, it, it, there was issues with what tenants meant to people in Northern Ireland. Was that right? Well, other brands were maybe investing more in it. And this was sort of the big move to bring tenants back front and centre in people's lives. Yeah, I think it was, again, looking at the younger generation. So thinking about LDA plus consumers, what, um, what were they into? because it was an aging brand in terms of, you know, the core consumer was, dare I say, at 40 plus. <laughs> and- um, Like the round chap leaning on the bar. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the younger generation just weren't, we weren't recruiting enough of them. So it felt like, you know, that recruitment just wasn't there. And this was an opportunity for us to recruit younger consumers, bring them into the brand and um and really talk about something that was a passion point for them so again just looking at what is culturally relevant and what are those passion points for young consumers and obviously music is always going to be a big one of them mm -hmm. and no brand was really owning that in northern ireland um i think in the south there was bits going on with you know you had bacardi with their b bar um which was an amazing activation as well and you had uh, Bex doing some stuff in the south but we hadn't really got anything like that in northern ireland so that was the opportunity for us to really focus in on the younger consumer and you know talk to them on a passion point that that they were um that they had and i think the great thing about vital was it, it with anything like that if you're going to spend money in the sponsorship you need to make it work really hard so the in-store promotions the stuff that came off the back of tenants vital i think were the strongest part we had you know before vital parties um, we had uh, competitions to win tickets. You know, those were the pieces that really worked uh, extremely well. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, we had some interesting acts there. We had Avicii, which was, was one of my favorites. We had Calvin Harris. Um, who else did we have? Uh, Any Temple was a favorite for me. Yeah. Uh, had a broken foot okay. and went down raving with my crutches. Yeah. So it was, it was great. And I think, um, you know, it, it did help us to recruit consumers, but also it built a lot of confidence with the with the pubs. So those pubs that, you know, that we had partnerships with, it was a big part of their year. Um, so that was the strength of Vital. Um, yeah. You needed a thick skin with Vital as well, didn't you? Because I'm going to, um, I don't know if you remember, but this comes up all the time when I talk about it all the time. Mm -hmm. Um Kings of Leon were at the height of their fame with, with whatever that big album was that was doing. It was smashing it everywhere. The Kings of Leon was huge. And you told me with advance, we like, right, we're launching on this day, the Kings of Leon headline acts. We're like, what the hell? Kings of, this is, 
this is big news. This is the biggest act in the world at the time. And um, 10 o'clock, whatever day it was, it went out. We put it out, big announcement, da, 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 Kings of Leon. And the first comment underneath it on Facebook was, Kings of Leon, it's just take that with guitars. <laughs> I don't remember picking the phone. You just can't please everyone. (laughs) You just can't. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. You know, like social media, keyboard warriors is hilarious. It's just part of the job in marketing. But yeah, you always got the, what is the consumer going to think of these acts? And you always had people that were complaining and not not happy about it. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know and i've seen that again you know you, you do need a thick skin but sometimes when you're creating some of that controversy it's a good thing you know we did like a on smirnoff we did a promotion with lad bible our partnership and it was really to redefine what it meant to be a lad so if you can imagine a few years ago lad bible was seen as like really laddy and mm-hmm. you know there wasn't really a space for gender equality in that world etc and no inclusivity agenda whatsoever so we did like a program with them where we showcased different people um within the bar industry such as a transgender barman or um some you know some other people as well um and i we got similar reactions you know we had we had put that content out and you know the first 100 comments were just horrendous but actually after a certain time we find that it's self-regulated so people came in and started to support it and that was when it was really nice to see that we were actually making a difference um sometimes when you're making big moves or brave moves you know you, you need to be upsetting some people if nobody's upset by what you're doing you're probably not doing the right thing you know if everyone thinks it's okay yeah really, you can't please everyone so you just have to do what you know is right and i think that's that's a really important part of it and i think especially when it comes to topics of inclusivity and, and diversity i think you know you have to know what's right and and be prepared to do that and have a voice and like a lot of the time you will get support, not all of the time, but a lot of the time you will get support. And, you know, although we, when you go online, there's a lot of, initially you might think, oh, there's a witch hunt here or there's certain negativity. I find that it does tend to self-regulate and you see people coming in with, with positive messages. Um, and that's, that's therefore what it's all about. And it's just trying to change those perceptions to even have something like that on Lad Bible alone, even if someone put a negative comment, you are broadening their mind, whether they like it or not, they're, they're seeing something that they're not expecting or on that channel. So I think it's, it can only be a positive, but um, the tennis fight one was kind of a lighter, much lighter version of that. But um, yeah, it was quite funny. It, it was a great event and I think I don't know if it sold out or not but it was huge anyway so um yeah music's like that though isn't it okay but no I, I, I do love the work that Smyrna's been doing in, in challenging and, and changing people's perceptions and, and here in Belfast there's a huge Smyrnoff mural um in the cathedral quarter as well which is probably more of a local activation than a, the, the yeah, yeah um but really pushing people to change perceptions and but you've got a platform and you, and you stand for something which I think is great for a brand to do uh, as long as it's authentic, which it is for, for Smyrna. So yeah, but well, you kind of have to, you know, we all have a role to play. So like, it's not even a choice. It's just something that, you know, you have to do it. Um, it's the right thing to do. So, yeah. And you, you had an early um, an early grounding in global brands. So that, that tenant's job is very much the sort of island based. Um, mm-hmm. After that, you, you were with Linwoods, which was selling in, in various different countries. And you, so you, you travelled a bit with that, including a, a stint in Iran or a trip to Iran. Sorry, Alan, a stint. Yeah. In Iran. Um, sort of culturally very different from Ireland. So you, how do how did you make a brand like Linwoods work in a in a very different market like Iran? Probably yeah. not with the budgets that you've got with with Smyrna. Yeah, it's an interest. Like Linwoods was just again, it was a great job, and it just broadened my horizons um, in terms of the different countries that I visited and that trip to Iran sort of lit a fire in me, I think that I wanted to do more of that sort of global travel and, and do a bit more. And I think, yeah, like consumers are this, not the same, but you know, there's similarities in, in consumers worldwide, you know? And I think as long as you're focused in on the behaviors in that market, as I said, the occasion that 
is most relevant. So for Linwoods, that was breakfast. Um, and then trying to just align the product to, well, what is the breakfast that people are having in Iran? Or what are the occasions where they would sprinkle seeds onto their foods? And it was using that that then we just got back. So it was still using like the core of our product and, you know, the core occasions for our product, but then just leveraging those for the Iranian market. But it was just an amazing trip because it's not somewhere that I had thought I would be going. And it was very last minute. So sort of get a call from the boss saying, you know, can you go to Iran? And I'm just one of those people that I'm a yes person anyway. So it was like, yeah, I'll go. And you probably were saying Aaron is in the Isles of Aaron. Is that <laughs> right? Just so right? Yeah. I know. And it was such an eye-opening experience. Like the people were so friendly. They just you couldn't understand why this uh blonde haired Irish lady was was coming over to, to Iran and why I was there and even going through the markets. Um you know, people were coming up to me and asking me why I was there and offering me, they have a very, um, they've got like a gifting culture. So if someone meets you, they will give you a gift a lot of the time, you know, if you have any type of relationship with them. So some of the shopkeepers were, you know, I came home with an extra 20 kilo bag because I'd been giving so much stuff. So just like little treats or little snacks and things that people saw me walking through with with some of the distributors and, and had come over with stuff so I just thought it was um it was really eye-opening and you know it's the same everywhere when you go and you speak to people that are just on the street and your regular everyday pe people that are there um it's just the same as as anywhere else so I find everyone really friendly and yeah it was just a, a really interesting experience Definitely. Um, I'm, I'm very jealous as well. It's on my list of places to visit. I mean, the, the cultural history of the world sits pretty much in and around Iran and the countries that border on. So, it's, so um, uh, yeah, one day I'm going to go and have a look around. It's, uh, yeah, busy. some of the architecture and stuff is really cool. Um, and even seeing, you know, it's, it's kind of mountainous there. Um, and apparently they have a lot of big wineries, etc., up in the mountains that you can go up to. So at the time I was I was really thinking I'm going to go back, you know, for a personal trip. Um, and I think, you know, if you were going to go, you can you can get a guide, um, which I had. So I had someone um, there who was uh, Iranian, but living in, in England. So they had met me and, and taken me there. So I would definitely recommend that um, just because it's so busy and hectic and, you, you know, you, there's no street signs. You don't know where you're going. <laughs> but um, I'd love to go back um, again sometime. Definitely. And then I'm just aware of the time. So I'm going to actually quickly... Uh, to take us back right to the beginning of your career in Coke, you, you started working with, with Coca Cola, um, so you're sort of ticking off all the big brands there as you go. What, what was that like? Sort of first marketing job for you, and you know, sort of entry level. What was do you remember yeah. that as fun days? Pardon? Do you remember that as being a fun time? Yeah, it was good. I think um, the interesting thing about Coca Cola is, you know, you are. Again, I wasn't part of the global team, so you're in the bottler. Obviously, Coca-Cola Ireland is the bottling side of things. So you don't get as much ownership and leadership over the, the marketing comms. You do get a lot of ownership of what goes on in store um, at a retailer level um, and the message, messages you're pushing out in the local market. So there's two big things I think I took from the time of Coke, and one of those was how to do in-store execution really well mm -hmm. so in terms of excellence they are top notch when it comes to shopper execution and how to show up in store so lessons that i learned there i'm still using today in terms of that um and then the other thing was my first tv shoot was was with um deep river rock so the water brand um so when i was brand manager on deep river rock i got to go along to the shoot and that that really um instilled a passion in me to be working on comms because it was just yeah it was amazing I loved it so those are kind of some of the the key things that I took from it I wasn't there for that long but definitely some good lessons on I think the Olympics and the Euros were both on one of the years that I was there and I was sort of in charge of the retailer activity so yeah that was that was mega because they just have big budgets to spend on Everything. on retailers so it was it was a fun time if, if you can compare and contrast just quickly um the first shoot you were on with deep river rock 
compared to the last in-person shoot you went to with Smirnoff. Mm. What were the differences between those two shoots? <laughs> probably the budget would be the first one. <laughs> um, you probably spent more on lighting with Smirnoff than the whole um, shoot. Yeah, I think so. Oh, I just think, you know, one of the, the key focuses in, in Diageo and one of the things I'm really focused on personally um, for my own growth is creative excellence. And despite us being a huge business where, you know, there's a lot of programs to ensure you're, you've got effectiveness in your marketing and you're getting return on investment, et cetera. In reality, they still have create, creativity as king. Mm -hmm. So um, that creative excellence is, uh, is really important. So I think the quality of the comms that we produce is just second to none. You know, our latest TV, TV ad, um, our infamous campaign, you could, you know, you can make a film from that. It's film great quality in terms of the, the look and feel. So I've just learned so much about what creative excellence is um, and how to, how to make sure you're always sticking to those high standards. And a lot of it's just down to making sure you you input the time, you know, what you put in, you get out. So making sure that it's well thought out, you're working with the best agencies possible. I think that's one of the other things I've really learned is that go with the biggest, best agency that you can for comms and then everything else, you know, it's not as important. But I think for the comms side of things, we we went for the, um, for the biggest agencies that we could. And that's something that, you know, I've learned from that perspective. Um, and then just making sure you've got like agencies within the local market as well that you can rely on that are more specific to the market. So we would have, you know, localized agencies in, in Ireland and then in Europe and across in Africa and LAC. So making sure that we've got the right, the right agency mix, I think, is really important for us as well. On that. I always say to people, spend what you can afford. Um, so it doesn't matter what size business you are. Don't penny pinch when you're picking an agency, you're picking a creative partner, you're picking a whatever. Don't yeah. penny pinch on it. Spend what you can afford. If you can no, afford I, I, ones, agree. I totally agree because there's no point doing something if you're not going to spend the money. And, you know, I learned that uh, we've probably had these conversations in the past, but, um, you know, when you've got kind of like a smallish budget, you're thinking, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to squeeze this person or I'm going to try and get as much as I can out of this agency you will not get the best work from an agency unless you pay them fairly. And that's just the bottom line. You know, yeah. you can squeeze all you want, but you're not going to get what you want out of it. That's so it's going to be clicked up and used yeah. in the promo. Is that yeah. a little bit on there? It's going <laughs> to be on my LinkedIn profile. Invest. It's important to invest in what matters, you know, and I think there's no getting away from the highest ROI stuff that you can do is the big stuff. And um, if you can afford to do it, then, then do it. Like I love in Northern Ireland when I'm home and I see you know a local company has has got has put themselves on tv whether it's a gym or a pizza company or whatever it is i just love seeing that because i just think you know it it is still king and you you're going to get the return on investment from that um so yeah really important great well we're coming to the end so i'm going to ask you two quick questions for you um book recommendations books podcasts uh, what is it what do you listen to what do you read or uh, just give us some examples of things people should check out. Yeah, I think one of the best books I've read over the last uh, while is probably Shoe Dog. So it's the story of Nike. So if you're into branding, marketing in any way and entrepreneurship, I think it's one of the best books that's out there. Um, I really love that book. I think it's great. So I'd recommend that one. Um, and then the other book, I think I like to not always. I know a lot of people say, oh, well, I listen to a lot of marketing stuff and I, I read a lot of marketing books, you know, that's just not how I am because I'm spending so much time on the job doing marketing anyway. So yes, I read the odd brand or marketing oriented book, but I love some uh, fiction as well. So the other book I would recommend is actually Dogs of, uh, Dogs of War. And it's a book about AI and um, the use of AI as war machines in the future. So it's really interesting read about, eth you know, ethically um, mm -hmm. about AI and, and what that could look like in the future. So it's a really good read for something that is not business orientated as well. So. I, I like that. I like that a lot. He interviewed a guy from Facebook, Nick, recently. 
And he was like, since lockdown, I've stopped reading business books. I need to have a yeah. shutdown of when work stops. This week, and I said, I'm a dead right. And obviously, you only need to listen to one marketing podcast. <laughs> I know exactly. Uh, I didn't. I didn't even copy there, but absolutely. So I, I don't mind. Either. And and lastly, then, what question were you expecting me to ask that I haven't asked you? Um, there's one I'm really glad you didn't ask me, and that is, um, what's it going to be like in the new normal? Oh, I'm not usually. <laughs> but usually, when we get to this question, I'm like, great. Well, and you can answer that. But no, it's such a shit question. Hey, uh, yeah. No, I know. It's it's my most hated term. Please let's leave the term new normal in. in the well, I was hoping in 2020, but let's leave it in 2021. Because <laughs> I just think people are going to want to get back out and do the things that they used to do. I don't believe that. You know, people are just going to change their habits 100. percent Like they're going to want to go out. They're going to want to party. They're going to want to go out and have a nice Smirnoff cocktail. You know, people are just going to want to do that. So yeah. Smirnoff Thank ice you for not asking me. What, Smirnoff what? ice, that's the answer. The new normal looks like Smirnoff ice is back. <laughs> that's it. We're never going to wait it's back. That's what the answer is. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Sarah, thank you very much for your time. I've, I've loved every minute of that. And um, yeah, brilliant. Thank you for being on the show. No worries. Speak to you soon. Thanks, Sarah.